Next up, uh, Representative Lee from Nevada for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair Stauber and Ranking Member for having this uh, hearing. I want to thank Mr. Ned for being here. And I want to acknowledge and meet my Republican friends halfway in emphasizing that I fully agree that our federal onshore oil and gas program has been mismanaged. But I also want to correct the record. It's been mismanaged for decades. And this administration is in reality taking steps that are long overdue in fixing this historic mismanagement with the proposed BLM oil and gas rule. Uh, in December of 2019, the GAO, at Congress's request, began conducting a performance audit of the federal onshore oil and gas program over the course of the last decade, and they released their findings in November 21. Uh, I'd like to ask any of my Republican colleagues, uh, do you know which state was home to more land nominated for oil and gas leasing than any other? I'll answer it for you. My home state of Nevada by a very, very long shot. From 2009 through 2019, more than two-thirds of the total acreage nominated for onshore oil and gas leasing was in my state, home to about 61 million of the roughly 87 million acres nominated nationwide. And adding insult to injury, only three and a half million acres, or about 5%, were ever leased. The bulk of this land instead is left to languish, unprotected for conservation, or unimproved for clean energy or outdoor recreation. Uh, but wait, there's more. Uh, Complementing GAO's investigation on this front, the Taxpayers for Common Sense recently did their own deep dive into the federal onshore oil and gas program. And once again, I'd like to ask, would anyone know or be able to guess what percentage of oil and gas leases issued in Nevada since the 1950s have ever actually produced oil or gas? Again, I'll help you with that answer. It is 0.3% since 1953, or 72 out of 22,141 leases issued in the last 70 years. Not 3%, not 30%, 0.3% producing leases. These findings make it painfully clear that Nevadans are not getting anywhere close to a good return on investment with this program as it exists, nor are the American taxpayers who have lost $34 million from outdated and below market leasing terms in Nevada just in the last decade alone. Many of my Republican colleagues on this committee self-identify as Theodore Roosevelt conservationists. That organization, uh, the organization that today bears his name, the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, has come out strongly in favor of BLM's proposed oil and gas rule, explaining that the proposal will steer oil and gas development towards lands with existing infrastructure or high production potential, ensuring taxpayers receive a fair share of return on that development while reducing conflict between energy development and our sporting traditions. My bill, the End Speculative Oil and Gas Leasing Act, would go even further and give this energy and taxpayer-friendly approach the force of law. Uh, Deputy Director Ned, three very quick questions. How many bids did BLM receive for your most recent oil and gas lease sale in Nevada this July? Congresswoman, it's my understanding, is zero. Correct. Did this lease sale nonetheless require your already overburdened and understaffed agency to devote taxpayer resources and staff time for re to re pre prepare for it? Yes, it did. And close to with it, I'm going to close with a question I've unfortunately had to ask more than once this Congress. Is it fair to say that America's taxpayers and public lands both stand to benefit from BLM rulemaking and bipartisan policy making that shifts focus away from speculative and unproductive leasing uh, in places like my home state of Nevada and toward non-sensitive places with a high likelihood of actually finding and harnessing significant energy resources? 
That is the intent of the rule, Congresswoman. Thank you. And with that, I yield. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes uh, the full committee chair, Mr. Westerman. Thank you.